All right, so I'm the economist. I'm supposed to give you the broad view of the state's economy. Uh, so the bad news is you have to listen to an economist. Uh, the good news is I have exactly 12 minutes to speak. Um, they say the definition of an economist is someone who's good with numbers, uh, but doesn't have the personality to be an accountant. So now I have 11 minutes. Um, so I'm going to give you a broad view of the state's economy. Uh, if, you're, if people from outside of the state of Texas was probably looking forward to see what happened in Texas this year, I think many thought that the state's economy would go into a sharp recession given the, a big decline in oil prices that has, has occurred and the perception that the growth in Texas over the last four or five years is mainly due to oil prices and, uh, and the expansion of the energy sector. And that has played a big role in Texas strength uh, but not the only role. And the state's economy uh, slowed quite sharply. Around mid-year, oil prices uh, leveled out at about uh, $60 per barrel, and things were looking pretty good. And then, obviously, recently, we've had a further decline, about 45 So uh, we know in the oil and gas sector, another shoe is falling. But uh, I still uh, am expecting, and my forecast is still predicting, that the state's economy will maintain positive job growth. Uh, for the remainder of the year. So overall, the state's economy uh, will have uh, very uh, mild growth of about 1%, uh, but positive nonetheless. Quite a bit different than the 1980s. And of course, you in Houston here know uh, what happened in the 80s when you had significant declines in energy prices. And while uh, things have weakened quite uh, a bit, uh, it's very, very different than the 1980s. So that's my kind of overview, now I have 10 minutes left, uh, but uh, I'm going to go through a few slides here. So if you look at the, the uh, expansion from the uh, recovery from the Great Recession, uh, Texas has done better than most states. We're, for every year up until this year, we're in the top 10 states in terms of the job growth rate. Um, and some of that story, as I said, was energy, some was construction. Not so much, you know, driven by energy, but construction uh, didn't get out of whack as it did in many southern sand states uh, where they had these housing uh, price collapses. We didn't see a housing price collapse in Texas. Uh, we had our little housing fiasco in the 80s, and we had uh, some uh, restrictions on uh, 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 mortgage lending that helped us not go through that again. And besides our prices, because of land availability in the state, don't swing as much as other places. So we didn't go through the, the housing crisis as much as many other states, and that helped us. And then exports. Tech, a lot of people don't think of Texas as a big manufacturing state. We're really not. If you look at manufacturing as a share of the economy, we're about uh, middle of the pack in terms of states. But if you look at exports, we're ranked in the top 10 uh, exports. Uh, states in the nation. Uh, the Census Bureau looks at jobs tied to exports as a share of total jobs in Texas, uh, certainly in the top 10. So exports is big here and exports from Texas have grown uh, much more rapidly during the recovery than other states. Um, uh, and a lot of it comes from the Gulf Coast and Houston and a lot of it's petrochemicals. Uh, we've had very good years in petrochemical exports. So last year was a strong year in the state's economy with broad-based growth. And then oil, oil prices peaked in mid-year at about 106, and then they declined to the end of October uh, last year. They were down to about 80. So people ask me, you know, what impact does the decline in oil prices uh, have on the state's economy? Well, that's a classic example of an economist's answer. I'd say it depends. Because it depends on where they drop to and where they drop, where they drop from and where they drop to. The drop from 106 to 80 didn't have uh, any negative effects on the oil and gas sector. They continued to drill. Most uh, uh, areas of the state that are drilling still make pretty good money at $80 a barrel. Uh, consumers got a little break in their uh, spending on gasoline and the oil and gas sector didn't slow. So initially there was a positive impact on Texas. Uh, and then after 80 and went down past below 
uh, uh, 60, about below 70, uh, and then we had very negative impacts. So obviously the, the, the uh, decline in energy prices has been uh, pretty brutal in many areas of the state. Plus we have a very strong dollar, and the dollar plays a role too on manufacturers. Like I said, we export a lot, uh, and that's been a, also a uh, significant uh, challenge to the state's economy. So the bottom line is I expect job growth to be about 1% this year. Uh, after growing 3.6% last year, it'll be the first time in 13 years that Texas job growth has been below the national average. Yet Texas is going to do rel relative to what we did in the 80s and relative to other oil and gas states. So if you look at uh, this chart, it's uh, job growth. Uh, now, uh, last year in 2014, you see Texas was the third fastest growing state. And everybody knows what that is on the left. That's uh, ND, uh, that's not Notre Dame, uh, that's North Dakota, uh, similar in size. Um, but uh, anyway, you can see last year there was uh, 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 the oil and gas states growth was kind of spread out across the country. The first several years of recovery, all of the oil and gas states were to the left. But last year was less about oil and gas, even though prices were high. Uh, but Texas, once again, was the third fastest. Now, if you look at uh, uh, this year, so far this year through August, which we have data for, you can see the oil and gas. Uh, North Dakota is the second worst performing state after being the strongest uh, last year. Uh, and these other states on the right-hand side, which you cannot read uh, from, from where you're sitting. Uh, this uh, speech is uh, sponsored by the local optometrist club. <laughs> okay. so. Uh, you can see over here on the right is uh, Alaska, Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico, Louisiana. Those are the oil and gas states. And you can see Texas, while it's uh, only 32nd uh, fastest growing state this year, is doing much better than the other oil and gas states. Let me see. How much time do I have? <laughs> Five minutes. I'm doing pretty good. OK. So if you look at sectors in the states, uh, uh, you know, different sectors in the state's economy, this is job growth. We use job growth a lot in states instead of output growth simply because we have the data. And the data is pretty good for Texas. Uh, so if you look at the left-hand side there, your, your left is um, uh, the energy sector. This is, so you can see that job growth in the energy sector was very, very strong. Uh, over the last four years, this is from 2012 to 2015, and then this year, uh, jobs in the oil and gas sector are declining by about a 16% annual rate. So everybody knows that there's been big layoffs in the oil and gas sector. Other sectors that have slowed have been construction. Uh, a lot of that has been uh, in in uh, Houston with uh, the really more about the uncertainty about what the oil price will do to the to the MSA's uh, 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 economy uh, than about actual uh, uh, impact. But anyway, so uh, construction is slow, manufacturing is way down. Uh, some of this is because our manufacturers produce a lot of stuff for the oil and gas sector. Um, uh, equipment, uh, fabricated metals, those types of uh, manufacturers produce for oil and gas. Plus we had a very, very sharp increase in the value of the dollar which means that the products we sell internationally have become more expensive. So manufacturing is weakened. We've had a little weakening in uh, finance, insurance, and real estate, but there's several sectors that are important to uh, the state's economy that actually have picked up this year. And that's growth in leisure and hospitality. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, consumers have more money in their pockets uh, and are spending more in uh, terms of hotels and uh, restaurants and such. And then um, health and education. So health and education is a broad sector, but it's mostly health because uh, public education is in government. Uh, so health care has actually been expanding this year after several years of weakness because of all the uncertainty uh, surrounding the Affordable Care Act. We're starting to see expansions in health care. Uh, so these are several sectors that are helping offset. But overall, once again, we're seeing uh, positive job growth, but very uh, much diversions across the sectors. Uh, the manufacturing sector, as I said, is weakened. We have a manufacturing survey that we do at the Dallas Fed, and we look at uh, production and orders uh, and the company outlook. 
Uh, starting earlier this year, those things uh, went into decline. Whenever this, uh, the lines are below zero, means that more respondents are saying declines and in increases. So I got two minutes now. Those three minutes went pretty fast. So uh, there was so starting to see some improvement in mid-year, and then the dollar spiked up again. Oil prices fell, uh, and now we're seeing weakness in manufacturing again. Uh, if you look at our exports, uh, this is the Texas value of the dollar, uh, which is not a dollar with Sam Houston's face on it. But uh, it is uh, the weighted toward countries we export to, and it's been very strong, just like the US value of the dollar and our exports have come down somewhat. There was some uh, pickup toward mid-year, but I think uh, we'll see some weakening once again. If you look at the oil and gas sector, we've seen big declines, as you know, in uh, this blue line is oil price, the red line is the natural gas. You see the rig count fall by about two-thirds, and then starting to pick up near mid-year, but now with the decline, the rig count is beginning to fall again. So which metros in the state are performing best? This chart says a lot. This is the share of jobs in uh, mining, which in Texas is mostly oil and gas. And you can see that uh, you know, Midland, Odessa is at the bottom. But in terms of big cities, you see Corpus Christi and Houston at the bottom. Houston has uh, been able to maintain about zero job growth so far this year, uh, which is pretty darn good considering the, the decline in the oil and gas sector. Dallas-Fort Worth is doing better, and Austin is doing the best, and you can kind of see the ranking based on the share of uh, the energy sector. So if you look forward to what's going to happen in the state's economy, uh, you can see that uh, the leading index that I have has been declining. It went up for a couple months near mid-year, and now it's beginning to decline again, uh, as uh, pretty much broad-based uh, indicators are showing decline. So in summary, the Texas economy uh, weakened in the first half of the year uh, significantly, but remained positive. Toward mid-year, we're starting to see some signs of improvement. Uh, but oil prices and the dollar uh, both changed quite sharply, and we're going to likely see continued uh, weak but positive job growth, less than 1% for the remaining months of the year. But if you look back and compare us to what happened in the 80s, or you look at us compared to other oil and gas states, uh, we're doing quite well. Uh, uh, continued growth in healthcare and leisure and hospitality and other industries and other areas of the state. Austin continues to grow very fast. Dallas is doing well. And this year we'll see about 1% job growth and my time is up. Thank you. <laughs>
400 barrel to 800 barrel wells because of fracking new technology. And you know, that is from a range from San Angelo North and into New Mexico. And that's not just in Texas, but the same thing is happening in the Dakotas, Pennsylvania, and everywhere to the United States. And we're gonna have a lot of oil. And uh, so then what uh, things happened, and uh, I hate to be saying uh, it came through because you know it became a nightmare. Anyway, um, we had to kind of study what was going to happen to our industry and where is our company going to stand. And it's going to be the same for what I studied this year, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be good for next year. You know, uh, we studied uh, you know our customers. What is going to make and keep our customers busy? Our customers, you know, uh, <coughs> in the past we heard about hedging, and we never paid a whole lot of attention to hedging as a service company because you know. Price of oil was good. But you know, hedging is playing a major role right now in the survival of these big companies. And in the, and it plays a big role in the survival of our companies. And uh, so we focus on companies who are hedging and uh, have done very good this year. But however, these contracts are gonna be expiring and new hedging prices are horrible. So they're not gonna be hedging next year. So we're gonna see a slowdown with those companies over hedged. The other customers we have, what we call guaranteed projects. Uh, customers who uh, have raised a lot of money, have the money in the bank from the investors, and have uh, this great field, and they're gonna build an infrastructure. But you know, what they're not gonna do is they're not gonna put on the big fat jobs and uh, the big um, horizontal wells. They're gonna play it safe, bring the wells in, and then maybe come at a later time and do those big fat jobs and do the horizontal leg where the really successful oil production comes from. And then you have the customers who are gonna be busy because they have to be busy of expiring leases. Uh, during the boom, leases were signed with uh, stipulations that the X amount of wells had to be drilled during uh, a 12 year period, I mean 12 month period. And you know, if they don't drill those wells, then they're gonna lose the lease. So they are forced to do some kind of drilling. Against those companies, they're probably gonna do a vertical well and take advantage of the cheap oil prices, I mean, uh, drilling prices and surface prices because they have dropped from anywhere from 20 to 40%. So uh, those guys, they're gonna they do a minimum amount of work and um, as a company, a service company especially, we are focusing in production. Uh, we're looking at companies who have lots of water because we're in the fluid transport business, disposal business, those are our marketing. But those guys, you know, as long as they uh, have a diesel production, they will continue going as the price of oil will hold up. And then the last, we looked at uh, different areas. You know, uh, you heard about uh, stripper wells. You know, these are wells that make five to 10 barrels a day. Those guys, they're gonna be in serious problems. They're not gonna have the money to rework a well, repair the well with the price all the way it is today. You know, compared to, uh, we'll see Pecos, uh, West Texas, like uh, San Angelo, and then New Mexico, where they make the 400, 800 barrel wells. Those guys, they have the money, the cash flow to continue on repairing and, and improving their fields. Next, we studied um, what are our service companies going to do. Not only the, uh, our competition, but the rest of the industry of service companies. And, uh, you know, uh, we look for this year and next year, and there are going to be some uh, big changes are coming down. It's going to be a make or break situation for, for a lot of them especially if they have borrowed a lot of money. Um, yeah, we kind of broke down our competitors and the service companies, and uh, you have the individuals who uh, started the business and built a nice business, start having some extra cash flow. Next thing you know, they're gonna spend money on luxury items, not business, not related items. And I think those guys are gonna be seeing some, really having a hard time to discipline themselves and get away from the luxury items and get back down to the core of the business. Then we have uh, seen some very successful companies. And uh, these guys that have made lots of money and uh, acquired lots of credit, 
and for whatever reason they get bored with the business or they want to get in a, another venture of the business, for example, starting a flag company, they borrowed a lot of money building these flag companies, and next thing you know, flagging is slow. But the core business is now having to cash flow the sick company, and now I'm going to see both those companies are going down because the good company cannot subsidize the, the sick company. And we're going to see several of those companies are going to be having serious problems in 2016. Then you have the companies are set up by investors, um, doctors, lawyers. We see them everywhere competing against us. And uh, what they do, they want to go and have a quick return on their money by getting into the oil field service business. They uh, either put a son in business or they put uh, a minority partner in business. And now, you know, the, there's going to be a lot of stress put on. The, there's no profit. So what to do is these minority partners, they're going to bail out. And there's going to leave the investor holding the bag. And, and they don't have the knowledge how to continue on in the oil field. And I've seen several competitors already having the door shut, have a lots of equipment sitting out there, but there's nobody running the business. So uh, next we studied um, pricing. What's uh, the effect of oil has to do with the pricing and services? And, uh, you know, uh, because of the drop of prices um, and business is slow, it, competition is intensified to enormous. And uh, we see some people quoting prices below cost. And uh, I think they're just trying to get some kind of cash coming into the door, hopefully to pay the bank to kind of keep the doors open for a little bit longer. But that will come to a stop in 2016. I think they're going to run out of cash and uh, uh, the door is going to be halfway closed. Then you have uh, the customers. The customers are re requesting cheaper prices and it has to be. You know, uh, we can't charge, the service companies can't charge when it was a hundred dollars a barrel. So um, now the customers have a choice. The cho uh, during the boom and a hundred dollars a barrel there was not enough equipment out there and uh, these customers had to use companies just to keep whatever service needs to work. But now, because things have slowed down, they have a choice of who they're going to use. And, uh, you know, they're going to come down to the reputation of the company, uh, the safety performance, and whatever potential liability they can share to the service company. So uh, we're going to see a, a lot of changes going on, a lot of bidding going on, and uh, they're going to, the old companies are going to focus on companies who have the cash flow, the safety programs, and, uh, you know, the companies are not going to have to worry about, do I pay the bank or put the money in the safety department? So that's why I think you're going to see some changes going on. And, you know, when you start for cash because you have a high debt load, sometimes you have not the choice. Fortunately, uh, standard, we enjoy very little debt. We've been very conservative. Um, 2009, I learned uh, the hard way, School of Hard Knocks. You know, um, I owed the bank $40 million. I, my personal guarantee was on that, and I said, you know what, I'm going to sit back this last next boom, and I'm going to pay the bank off, and we're relatively debt-free, and now it's going to pay dividends. Then we studied the cost approach on the supply chain, and we contact the vendors and say, hey, guys are going to have to help us because you all are all together. And we see, you know, the effect of low prices from Walmart to the local restaurants to the local Harley Davidson dealership. So, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a struggle coming on even more in 2016. <coughs> then we studied the labor market. And, you know, uh, we cut wages 10 to 20 percent in the company, in, talking from standard. And um, everybody else in the industry had to do that to compete with the, the low prices. Um, you know, the cost of inflation of the service companies was based on the cost of labor. Labor was the, the driver of why the service companies <laughs> were so expensive. The, but what we'll see now is that, uh, and Pat and I were talking about it, is there's about 40,000 people looking for jobs or unemployed because of what happened to the oil, uh, oil prices. But you know, uh, we see very little and uh, very few applications come in right now. And my take on that is, is I think we have a labor market that's sitting on the sideline. 
And one reason is, during the boom, there was very little time off. So those people are all taking a break. And they're just sitting and hoping that things are coming back and they can go back to work. But I think there's a large pool of labor sitting on the sidelines, seeing what's going to go on. And they're drawing unemployment. The bad thing is, is you know, we had a uh, somebody put an application in and we offered him a job. And uh, he said, okay, good. But then we told him, you know, we had a 10% reduction in pay for the same job he was uh, used to do. And uh, he said, no, thank you. I said, why is that? He said, my employment officer told me I don't have to take a job and cut in pay for the same job. So he's down again, unemployment. So uh, I, I foresee still some difficult time to come, especially in 2016. I think it's going to really set in because uh, this year those companies are still working off their accounts receivables and cutting back and they're getting <coughs> leniency from the bankers to stretch out notes. But I think 2016, I don't see the price getting any better and uh, there's going to be some hard times to come. Um, I remember very well when I started in business, the hard times were there and we saw $12 a barrel. And you know, uh, we thought it was a dream to see $45 a barrel. We could only dream, would it get up to $45 a barrel? Now, you know, that dream turned into a nightmare. $45 is a nightmare. And you know, the bad thing is, we're gonna have to wake up and learn to live with $45 a barrel. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for uh, having me here today. I'm going to cover a lot of ground in an industry that is going through an extreme amount of transition. Uh, first, uh, do we all believe that healthcare is changing? There's a whole lot of folks, quite frankly, who don't think it's changing. Some of us inside the industry think the change is so pronounced, it is going to have as much an effect as, for instance, the movement from film to digital had on Kodak. There are going to be, quite frankly, some winners and some losers in this space as we transition in healthcare. And why do we think that there's a transition in healthcare that is uh, so necessary and so timely? This is a graph of the expenditures um, of every healthcare uh, country um, and then the life expectancy. You can see the USA is over on the right. Our expenditures are the highest on one axis, but our life expectancy is lower than a whole lot of other countries. So that's a macro sort of indicator in terms of relative to how we perform relative to the rest of the countries in the world. But here's a more telling slide with regards to the economic impact in the United States. On the bottom left hand side you see it's a busy slide, but suffice to say that the two lines moving up show the rate at which premiums have grown for your employees and for employers. And the bottom uh, line at 43% and 54% is the rate at which average wages have increased. So there's a very strong macro indicator that this has a huge impact on the middle class. The affordability, the affordability of health care has a huge impact on the middle class. And it is the number one cause for bankruptcies in the United States. That's a long, long fact. Um, so uh, here's another one, and I'm not going to get into the socio-cultural issues associated with this slide. But you can see that these are all the, a lot of industrialized nations, and they trend in cost. Look at what happens at age 57 to the cost in the United States. There's a lot of social uh, and cultural issues associated with that, but our costs spike. And one of the things I'm going to sort of uh, underscore in this presentation is our system is very fragmented. And that fragmentation in terms of how our system functions exaggerates itself as you increase the spend the spend in the industry. So more to come on that as we continue to, to uh, go through um, other indicators. I want to pause on this slide for a moment because this is pretty um, telling. For our nation, healthcare is 2.9 trillion in spend, almost 18% of the GDP. That's why the Affordable Care Act was enacted to arrest that cost trend. I'm going to talk about some of the macro indicators around how the industry both privately and from a public policy perspective is trying to get its arms around it. You can see that the expenditures are $9,200 per person. Those kinds of indicators aren't sustainable, particularly when we think about the economic 
um, uh, engine and the growth and the sustainability in the United States. So um, just to, this is a busy slide. I just want to highlight a few things. Um, the industry has typically functioned for all of you who have quite frankly had a procedure. You get a bill from the anesthesiologist, the pathologist, the hospital, pre-acute, post-acute. It's very fragmented. And every one of those parties is paid differently. And that's a part of how the industry grew up. So a very fragmented and siloed payment and care delivery model. And you can see that as we start to transition from the left to the right, we're going to be looking at payment reform models. The second thing that I think is perhaps most important is data is relatively non-transparent. So for instance, if a patient presents at a healthcare system, we know what happens to that patient when they present. We have very little focal range about what happens to that patient when they're outside of our delivery network. And so creating that longitudinal view of the patient allows us to arrest the cost curve, but different parties within healthcare own different pieces of information. So you're gonna see some migration towards much more transparent and consolidated information streams. And I'm gonna talk about how that's affecting the merger mania that's taking place in healthcare right now. So we uh, actually uh, uh, spend a lot of time on this slide, and if you take the entire of the Affordability Care Act and the Accountable Care Act, it distills into this. A movement from fee-for-service, disparate payments, illness and cure, meaning the, pre the treatment of disease when it presents, when the heart attack presents, <coughs> when the condition presents, moving from that kind of a, 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 a orchestration to fixed payment, bundled payments, for the entirety of a patient's health, um, outcomes driven, not incident driven, um, and integration. We're going to come back in, the, in our industry. The term integration is very prominent nowadays. We talk about it in clinical integration, integrated delivery systems, the integration of payment as well as delivery models. So doesn't that sound simple? Just improve the quality and reduce the cost. That is the tenant of the entire, the entire of the Affordability Care Act is improve the quality, reduce the cost. Doesn't that sound simple? Let's take 60 years of payment mechanisms and delivery systems and mega healthcare systems and just get those to work together and let's, let's uh, arrest that cost trend. So this is where you're gonna see the areas of focus and I'll talk about sort of the macro industry trends in a moment. You're gonna see a focus on cost and quality. End of life care has got to be central to the public debate. It has to be. There's a lot of alarmist rhetoric around death panels, but the truth is, is that that's really not the issue. It's about the appropriateness of care at the right time given certain disease processes. Lifestyle and individual accountability, perhaps the hardest issue to, to address when you're thinking about sort of reform in healthcare. And as a matter of fact, in all the areas that I focus, this is the lowest down on the spectrum because it is one of the most difficult to get at with regards to arresting cost trends. Payment mechanisms, administrative cost, uninsured. There is a big move uh, when uninsured presents into a delivery system. It gets paid for by who? Those of us who hold insurance premiums, right? We're seeing our rates grow up, so you're going to see significant move into uh, public exchanges and private exchanges. That was a tenant of the Affordable Care Act, was to provide insurance for those who could not uh, have access to it. That is a economic impact that will play its way through the system. We'll talk about how that's moving in Texas, and we'll talk about the, the impact that we expect to have happen. So here are the macro trends, and I'm just going to highlight these for a few minutes. Accountable care organizations, a little known uh, piece of the legislation inside the Affordable Care Act is the creation of an accountable care organization. What does it do? Healthcare is a very, very regulated industry. To distill it into very simple language, it removes the legislative barriers to fixing some of our problems. There's a lot of legal things that allow us not to share incentives between doctors and physicians, and it says, for all intents and purposes, if you commit to that tenant, we will relax those restrictions and allow you to do some things that are very unique inside the industry. I'm going to talk about the growth of that. Mergers and acquisitions, you're going to see a lot of enrollment through public and private exchanges, and in 2018, I would predict there is going to be a wall of sound that hits the industry and all of you as employers with regards to whether or not you continue to maintain health insurance or uh, uh, pay the taxes and the penalties associated with uh, allowing for enrollment on the exchanges. I'll briefly talk, talk about um, technology innovation. So lest we not know it, Texas is big in accountable care organizations. Accountable care organizations are hospitals, physicians, and other organizations coming together and experimenting in the delivery model to see if we can reduce cost and improve quality. 
So Texas ranks in the top four states in the country. Um, uh, over a million lives, a million lives at $9,200 per member per year gets to be a big number. We have 54,000 lives in our accountable care organization. So Texas is big in this space. And Medicare is drawing out of every one of those accountable care organizations best practice. And they're using that to shape public policy and legislative reform as we continue to tweak the Accountable Care Act going forward. So this is the performance. Memorial Hermann actually had the most successful accountable care organization in the country. What does it provide for? It's simply called a Medicare Shared Savings Program. You have 50,000 lives. If you save money year over year, believe it or not, the federal government, CMS, splits the difference with you 50-50. So this is the ranking of all the accountable care organizations in the United States. We saved $111 million over two years, for which we got a check for $55 million. These are the organizations that have made money. I could extend this graph over. You'd see a whole lot of places that have lost money. What's Medicare doing? Mining the experiment and the experience inside each one of these to try to figure out what models work. I would believe very strongly and continue to believe that the innovation can't come from legislation. It has to come from this realignment within the industry um, with private uh, business practices um, evidence through uh, the delivery mechanisms. Second is merger mania. This is what's uh, taking place. I took this out of modern healthcare three weeks ago, and it was obsolete by the time uh, I did the first presentation. You can see the size of these acquisitions taking place. Anthem bought Cigna Insurance. Cigna's a big provider in this market. Blue Cross, a big provider in this market. Look at the size of these deals, 53 billion. Um, Aetna has acquired Humana, that's 35 billion. What's the reason for a lot of these mergers? Now that the Affordable Care Act has been sustained by the Supreme Court ruling, uh, the larger the companies are, the more they're buffeted from some of the waves that we're gonna encounter in the industry going forward. This list is long, and it continues to express the uh, reorganization within the industry around one insurance companies coming to a health plan near you at some point. There are standstill provisions inside these mergers at this point, but in about 24 months, you're gonna see reorganization of the payer market. So at the same time, we're having reorganization within the delivery market, you're gonna see reorganization within the payer market. You're seeing a lot of pharma in here, and I would suggest the other frontier is technology. And I'm gonna give an example of that at the tail end. I have not seen in my entire career more technology advancements in terms of systems and unique delivery models as I am seeing now. It is a real frontier with regards to um, innovation. You're also seeing in the state of Texas a very high and rapid degree of enrollment in the public exchanges. And I expect that that is gonna continue. And the effect that that will have on employers, particularly as the Cadillac tax kicks in in 2018, and there is the opportunity to move your employees out into a private exchange. These are sort of a litmus test indicator for how that program works. Remember, the website was down with the first year of enrollment. There was a lot of uh, made about how that website worked. Those things have been worked out. And that, that program with regards to enrollment and the management of patients and their introduction into a care delivery system, a lot of these folks haven't had in healthcare insurance before, is going to continue to work its way through the industry. So here are the challenges that we're going to have in this space. And I would, I would suggest that healthcare in 24 months, in 36 months, will not look like healthcare today. Um, it will continue to advance, but we all have very provincial interests. Hospitals are paid different than physicians, are paid different than insurance companies, are paid different than post-acute and SNS and LTAX, I can go on down the list. We have provincial interests and we hold different pieces of the information. So one thing you're gonna see is a defragmentation of information for the pay, uh, benefit of the patient. You're going to see the alignment of interests around different and new technologies and care delivery mechanisms. Absorbing new technologies, there is an extreme amount of new technologies out there that, again, are coming through with risk stratification. As an example, we can now take information from an employer, which we were never able to do before, risk stratify the entire population. I now can make a prediction about the likelihood that Mrs. Jones, who is in your employment, is going to be in the emergency room in the next six months. It's all algorithmic based, and at the same time, the algorithm is looking over its shoulder to say, am I accurately predicting disease incidents and the likelihood of a, an emergent event? These technologies are out there, and they're being implemented at a very rapid pace by healthcare organizations in an attempt to uh, reduce cost expenditures. So this is sort of the warning post. Um, 
for many of you that lived through the 90s, uh, with regards to the first attempt at reforming health care, you'll remember that that was a pretty, that's a study in uh, failed uh, policy implementation um, that didn't go very well, go slow to go fast. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, infrastructure that needs to be built to accurately navigate some of the changes in this almost $3 trillion uh, industry. Uh, let's not repeat the uh, mistakes of the 90s in Clinton care. Continue to align incentives, absorbing new technologies. I'll just give a very brief example. I went to a conference in Silicon Valley. An individual got up and said, I wrote this really neat algorithm. What it does is it analyzes the angle at which a car photograph has been taken the color of the car, the make, the model of the car. He says, so I can cluster them together by where that photograph was taken. He drops one picture, two, three. He drops a million pictures on a screen. He says, don't they cluster nicely together? He says, now that's a very nice, interesting technology. He says, now watch me replace one million car photographs with one million pathology slides. Now I can tell you in seconds whether or not you've got something that needs to be looked at with a little bit more detail, and I am accelerating the rate at which your disease is diagnosed. And so these technologies are coming forward at a rate at which I haven't seen before. They're very disruptive. They'll be disruptive on the macro and the micro level, and we'll continue to see more of that going forward. And un I would underscore, and I say this perhaps most frequently in my presentations, uncharacteristic partnerships with uncharacteristic partners. We have to think about the redesign of the delivery system for the benefit of the consumer and the patient in an effort to improve quality and reduce cost and uh, improve the cost trend in the country. So a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time, so thank you. Thank you. All right, automotive retail is generally considered to be somewhat of an economic barometer, and I think that's been the case in, uh, in the years since the uh, uh, 2008 credit meltdown and recession. This is just to give you a little perspective on our company, which is headquartered here in Houston, which is, uh, we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange under GPI. We're the third largest in the U.S. You may recognize some of those names, AutoNation, Penske uh, are the two larger than us. Penske and Group One are the only international ones. Van Tile is now known as Berkshire Hathaway. But you can see auto retail is kind of a large revenue business. Uh, not so great on the margins. We, we move a lot of money. Let me skip that one quickly. I'll come back to it. This just shows you our brand mix. Uh, what may be uh, interesting to, to you is we are the largest auto retailer in Houston, in Texas, and in the state of Oklahoma. That used to be a good thing until oil got to be about $45 a barrel. Um, but you can also see that we're spread around the U.S. and we're also in uh, Brazil and the U.K. So about 17 or 18 percent of our revenues come, come outside of the U.S. And if you think it's tough at $45 uh, a barrel oil, you ought to be in Brazil if you want some, uh, to sharpen your economic skills and your operating skills. Uh, we're a very big Toyota company, this, uh, but we're also big with Ford, BMW, Honda, Nissan. You can see we manage a brand portfolio um, and a geographic portfolio. So we, uh, we, we like to have growing brands and growing markets, which is how we got into Brazil, but uh, I'm sure it's going to grow again someday if I live long enough. Um, okay, this is, um, this is a reflection of the U.S. economy. This is the automotive uh, industry sales. It's called SAR because it has to be seasonally adjusted. All right, every month you sell so many cars, but you don't sell as many in November as you do in August. So every month when we get car sales data, it's projected to an annual rate. You can see it dropped to about 10 and a half million in 2009 following the, the credit meltdown in 08. This is a credit driven business. That put two manufacturers uh, into bankruptcy as you know. We're now back to a 17 million annual rate. The month that ended yesterday, September, actually annualized to over 18 million for the first time in a long time. I don't think that was supported a lot by Texas and Oklahoma, but at the current time, auto sales are quite strong, which is a reasonably good economic <laughs> indicator. Okay, what drives auto sales? Quite simply, consumer confidence. If you feel good about your future and your job and, and so forth, you buy a car. That correlation uh, is, is very high and has been for a long time. Now, what's been driving uh, U.S. auto sales since 2009? Well, quite simply, we say the age of the car park. That's the units in operation. 
There's probably 250 million cars in operation, cars and trucks, in the U.S. People are generally shocked to learn that the average age of a car on the road in the U.S. is 11 years old. I mean, there's necessity for these people to, to trade these cars. Now, they may buy a used car, not a new car. And, and by the way, the used car market is about two and a half times bigger than the new car market. So it's kind of 40 million, 35 or 40 million. Okay, um, you buy, in the U.S., you buy a car based on a monthly payment, right? It's the affordability, the accessibility of the car that makes a difference. Financing is driving this upward trend line also for uh, auto retail. Um, banks, banks very much know the formula for lending on a car. They learned in the recession that people make their car payment before they make their house payment. Why? You have to get to work. Right? You know, that public transportation is only prevalent in a couple of U.S. cities, really. So you, you pay your car so you can get to your job. Uh, used vehicle prices remain robust. All right, that helps for a trade-in. That, that allows leasing, a, a component of leasing. About a quarter of the, the cars sold in the U.S. are leased. Well, the lease payment, half of that is kind of a depreciation figure, right? And so a strong projected used car value makes the lease payment lower, makes it more accessible. It, the number of licensed drivers in the U.S. is still going up. And although it kind of hammers us in these energy states like Oklahoma, in Texas, the average U.S. consumer has more disposable income because they're not putting so much in their gas tank every week. And many people are willing to take that money they save and buy a new car. Okay, lending, uh, again, we have a lot of bankers here. Um, you know, lending is driving a lot of these car sales. The average length of a, of a car loan you can see is now over five years, right? And, and for used and new, it's, it's over five years. 25% of our car loans are for 72 months. Yeah. I personally hate to see that um, because these people get what we call upside down in their car, right? They can't pay it off as fast as it depreciates no matter what you put down on it. So then it's hard for them to flip out of it if they need to liquidate the car or they want a new car. But that's the nature of the beast. And so lending is really driving this, but the length of the loans are getting longer. But with these low interest rates, it's also very easy for the auto manufacturers to subsidize the rate of the loan, right? Zero percent for 60 months, 1.9 percent for, for uh, 36 months. You, you hear those promotions, and it's driving this sales trend. Now, I told you gas, lower gas prices. Um, you have more disposable income to the consumers, all right? So many of those people choose to buy a car, but it's also shifting the mix of what we sell to bigger vehicles. You can, you can see the yellow line is truck sales. As the price of oil and gasoline goes down, we, you know, people belly up to the bar and buy a big old Suburban or Tahoe or F-Series truck. And, and so now that is good for the auto manufacturers. They make more money on the big vehicles than little vehicles, but um, you know you can see that that probably can't be sustained long term for a lot of environmental reasons. Okay, Texas is not all oil, but it became more oil at $45 a barrel than 60. And what, what Keith said is somewhat what we're seeing. We did learn that in that first uh, hit down to $60 a barrel oil that Houston and Texas is a lot more than oil. We weathered that downturn pretty well. We're now going to have to be very vigilant because this last downturn to $45, it does seem that things may be getting softer in our business in these areas um, like Houston, like Beaumont, um, in areas that uh, Oklahoma in particular, um, where they really don't have the same economic diversity that we have in Houston. Um, so we're going to have to be, be vigilant. I think Keith really did a good job of, of hitting that. Now, um, what's the employment situation in our industry? We need people. We have not been able to hire enough technicians for five years. Technician is a skilled job. A good technician can make well over $100,000 a year. 
You know, we're hiring technicians as fast as we can. We're hoping we get some people coming back from the oil field um, to, that, that want to work as technicians, some skilled people, but we haven't seen it yet. Maybe what Peter said, maybe they're sitting on the sidelines for a while. We also need service advisors, the people that actually wait on the customers in the service drive. We need salespeople. So we cannot hire enough revenue producing people. We have a real need, and some of these are good, good paying jobs. And that's in Houston, and that's in Oklahoma, even during these times. Now, trends in our industry that you may be interested in. Okay, we said, you know, when the revenue level drops during an economic correction, the manufacture of automobiles is a fixed cost business. They cannot adjust their cost structure. In my business, retailing, we have some flex to our cost structure. People advertising inventory, we can flex it. Auto manufacturer can't. It's a scale business. You've seen Renault and Nissan go together. Dongfeng is a Chinese company that now bought into Peugeot, which is known as PSA, one of the French auto manufacturers. If you read the business press, you'll see the, the CEO of FCA is begging to merge with some company, in particular General Motors. So you're going to see more consolidation in the manufacture of automobiles. Consolidation at retail. The business we're in is becoming a bigger business. That's why companies like us have continued to grow. The real estate in markets like Houston, Dallas, Los Angeles, it's no longer a family business. We frequently will have a facility that costs $40 million with land and building. Now that's, that's not a family business anymore. Alternative fuel vehicles. I'm sure you read about that. Tesla is the one that seems to get all of the, all of the publicity. You know, then, uh, but out of 70 million vehicles sold every year, 300,000 are electric. You know, out of 17 million in the U.S., <coughs> Tesla sells 40,000. It, it's not significant yet. Even in green countries, Scandinavia and Germany, they don't sell very many plug-in electric vehicles. We're not nearly as, as close to that as people would like to believe. Obviously, there's going to be a movement that direction. Toyota is betting on hydrogen fuel cells. Obviously, there's not an infrastructure to put hydrogen in your car. They're starting that in California. Ride sharing, you probably read about Uber and Lyft. Will that impact the auto business? Maybe somewhere down the road, but again, this is more a displacement for taxis and rental cars. If people who, who want to own a car still own a car. Um, the younger generation clearly um, likes to, to use things like ride sharing and the convenience they can do to get the car where they want it, when they want it. But thus far, there's, there's no near-term material impact that anyone in our industry can see. But it could be a long-term issue. Self-driving automobiles, that's going to happen. The technology is here. How they manage the legal liability, not so clear. Um, you know, when, when your, your car's coming down the road uh, and a child runs out, do you program it to run over the child or go left to center and hit the other car head on? I'm sure somebody will figure it out. There is, there is um, a market for this, older people. You know, people get in their 80s and 90s and they shouldn't be driving. You know, if they can have a car that will get them there safely. We can get these people who go to bars at night to use them. I mean, there is a market for autonomous driving, but, and the technology exists. I mean, these cars, these cars work right now, but how we, how those get adapted into society, no one's exactly sure. And that's, that's it. Um, let me, let me, uh, let's start with, let's go back to, to Chris and medicals. I found that uh, very interesting. Not it was all interesting, no, listed, but just you're sitting closest to me. So um, what's your outlook on sort of long-term trends for prices? What, how much different are we going to see things five, ten years from now? I don't think. Uh, your mic's on. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes? Is that better? So I don't think you're going to see an arrest in premium prices that all of you are paying for health insurance uh, in the near future. I think you're going to see some very um, interesting benefits design models that companies and employers can advantage themselves of 
that may narrow your choice of networks because a lot of those companies and, and accountable care organizations that are experimenting are getting better at compressing cost and they are probably going to go at risk in the future and say we guarantee you a trend guarantee one to two percent a year but you sort of got to keep it inside our network inside the family but I don't think you're going to see general premium broad-based products uh, go down in price. But I do think that over the space of the next four or five years, you're going to start to see some leveling out, maybe some reductions. Thank you. Any, any, before I get my cards, any questions from the audience? Just might want to raise your hand and try. Please. Yeah, Okay, so the question. So the question is: Is does data transparency inside the industry come at the expense of HIPAA? I think that um, it's going to come in the form of tweaking to the Affordable Care Act and the Accountable Care Act that allows for exchange of information in different ways. But I don't think that's really what drives it. I think what really drives it is the willingness of the private parties to exchange it. There are a whole lot of things we can do inside the industry that has nothing to do necessarily with regulation. It has to do with what we're willing to share with one another, blinded or unblinded, that allows us to know the complete health condition of a patient or a population. So there's more that can be done inside the industry than needs to come from regulation. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions for, for Earl. So this is related to the financing of, of vehicles. So one question around leasing, could you talk a little bit about where, you, where leasing occurs and the price points for vehicles, you know, is it for the, the, the super premiums or, you know, down the spectrum? Um, and second question in terms of financing is on um, whether there's a, a problem for sort of the equivalent of subprime borrowers in the automotive sector. We've heard regulators and others talk about that, um, and could you get your opinion on that, please? Yeah, first on leasing, um, you do see leasing much more prevalent in luxury brand automobiles. I think the slide said 27% uh, of the automobiles in the U.S. are leased. Uh, in, in Texas, it's a much lower number. Some of this has to do with personal property tax and the way states treat uh, leases. But um, your big leasing pockets are in the northeastern U.S. and in California, uh, where people uh, turn vehicles a lot and the, and the tax treatment is, is favorable. But it tends to be more of a luxury brand phenomenon. Also, Japanese brands tend to do well in leasing because they have high resale values, so they can get a very competitive lease price right? because they don't have to have a big monthly depreciation hit, say, compared to many of the domestic brands historically. Um, on subprime financing, about 25% of the business we do, uh, and, and most of the companies like our company do, are subprime. And believe it or not, um, that, that too is a pretty well understood uh, formulaic business and we have not seen any any negative trends or any increasing trends in terms of the mix of that business so that that has been a stable business and it's it's about a, a quarter of our business in, in most big companies great thanks uh, a couple questions for Peter and Keith can you all talk about the experts export side of the oil business and is it a good thing for Texas what's what's what are things looking like in terms of uh, the U.S. or the region's exporting of, of oil or energy products? To be honest, I'm not an expert. Expert. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't think it's going to have much uh, effect on our business because, you know, our business is driven by the price of oil. And if we're going to export, I don't see the price of oil changing because of the world glut market supply so I don't think it's going to make much of a difference in our business um, so oil and oil products oil products are quite a bit different if you talk about like refined products so uh, certainly the refineries in Texas have benefited from the ban on exports of oil uh, but uh, uh, obviously it it's you know, refineries are built for certain types of oil, and we produce certain, we used to produce heavy, now we produce light with uh, the fracking. So it makes sense that we uh, um, lift the ban on oil exports. Uh, uh, but um, in terms of petrochemicals, uh, one of the reasons why Houston has not been hurt worse is because it's undergoing this big petrochemical expansion. 
uh, and that's because of all the natural gas in Texas. And the uh, petrochemical producers here use natural gas more than uh, oil-based products, and so we have a cost advantage. And that will continue uh, because of this huge supply of natural gas we now have with fracking. And so the, the kind of boom in exports that Texas is doing that I showed in the chart, a lot of that is uh, petrochemicals based on this kind of comparative advantage we have in, in petrochemical expansion. Uh, in petrochemical production, and we'll continue to have that uh, advantage, even as the advantage has shrunk somewhat as the price of oil has come down, but it's still there from a historical basis that uh, a margin between oil and natural gas is still uh, high. So I think we'll continue to see exports of uh, refined products. Uh, we ex export a lot of diesel fuel. Uh, we export a lot of petrochemicals, and hopefully in the future we'll be exporting oil. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chris, we have a question on uh, telemedicine, and, and for for the professors in the crowd, could you talk about what telemedicine is, and then the question asked for your opinion on it. Yeah, so telemedicine is in the eye of the beholder. Everybody sees it differently. Um, for some folks, it is simply having an app on your phone and able to access a physician. Um, for others, it is a way to have a specialist and a primary care physician discussion around a patient. It just depends on who accesses it. Um, I think that this is going to be a disruptive technology in healthcare. Um, there's a lot of debate, as many of you know, about um, the use of telemedicine in the state of Texas. But I can tell you in other states, um, they have gone from 50, 60,000 enrollees to 2 million enrollees in six months. The question is not whether or not telemedicine is going to be present as a part of the delivery system. It's how it's constructed and how it's used. And what are the quality underpinnings? If it's just a way to call somebody and get a prescription without um, evidence-based medicine beneath it, not very well implemented um, and constructed. However, um, it is going to be a big force within um, the delivery mechanisms and reforms. I, I believe that eventually we will have a policy decision about how it's implemented in the state of Texas. We will see um, some uh, increased use of telemedicine in various forms. Thanks. Um, so back to Earl. A couple questions on uh, things changing. So one of the things that's difficult when you teach finance is to explain Warren Buffett. Because um, we talk about markets being sort of efficient and say don't look at Warren Buffett's experience. Um, so what about Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway in the automotive sector? What's, what's the outlook there um, and, and what do you think is that, that the impact will be in, of that entry? Yeah, there, there's a couple elements to Warren Buffett in investing directly in our business. First, it validates our business model. Uh, which is good because we're, we're a bit counter-cyclical. Uh, we survived through the downturn because we're not only new cars, we're used cars and parts and service. And parts and service is a much more uh, stable part of, of uh, the business than, than selling the cars. About 40% of our profit comes from uh, parts and service. Um, uh, I think what Mr. Buffett saw wasn't the margins. Our operating margins are maybe 4%. And we pay 38% in taxes, 35% federal, and two or three, depending on the state mix. But it's a great cash flow business. And I think uh, Mr. Buffett is a, a, a student of cash flow. And uh, what we do with that cash flow, we can either invest in the business, which is what we tend to do, buy back shares, or you can make a dividend, right? So it's a, a continual capital allocation uh, challenge. But the beauty is there is cash. Uh, even in the tough times that these types of businesses spin off, and I think that's why, why he invested. The problem is, when he did get into our business, every independent dealer in America thought Warren was going to drive up in a Brinks truck and buy their family business. And that inflated all the prices, so we weren't able to buy anything for, <laughs> for the last six months. But I think that, too, will pass, and he's an astute business person, and I don't think he's going to play Santa Claus to everyone. So. Yeah. Warren didn't get to be Warren by overpaying. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Peter, could you talk? You talked a little bit about your outlook in the, for next year and prices, and the question is beyond that. So, what what's your sort of crystal ball for 2017, 18? What do you think? You th is this is the drop in production going to eventually come let prices recover? And then there's also a related question on on any outlook in natural gas. Well. Uh our feeling is, you know, 2016, I mentioned the hedging, and the hedging is going to stop because the, the new passes in the hedging are not going to be attractive to hedge. So the companies are hedging are going to cut back on production, and I think eventually we have enough of those companies going to do that 
we're going to see maybe a better pass of all. Uh, 2017 is a long ways back uh, forward for projecting pass of all. If uh, anybody tries to project the pass of all a month from now, you know, he's a, a genius. So, you know, uh, <laughs> we're not going to be predicting anything about 17. Yeah, thank I appreciate it. When I, when I teach finance, people ask my outlook on the stock market, and I'll say, if I really knew, I wouldn't be teaching. Uh, I'd be retired. Uh, so uh, back, to, back to Chris. So uh, one of the other emerging technology trends is wearable, wearable technology, those kinds of things. Do you see uh, applications there in terms of uh, eventually leading to better healthcare outcomes, decreasing premiums, cost savings, as we start to learn how to collect data from those kind of things, much the way that I think the automotive industry is doing things with monitoring driving to, to impact your insurance premiums there? Yeah, so um, interesting uh, subject. Um, it depends on how it's used. So the answer is maybe. Some companies have implemented those technologies inside of their um, industrial plants, and every employee that walks in it compares everybody in terms of their health status and a whole series of things. There have been some experiments where they have gone as far as to implement, uh, put chips inside of uh, Department of Defense workers. You can imagine the HIPAA issues associated with that. But the base uh, um, medical director for all 5,000 people on the base every day gets a read of how many people had their heart rate above a certain amount, how long it was sustained there, what time they did it, male, female. These are experiments in population health, the management of population of health. Now, some of these um, actually uh, wearable technologies they're saying are contributing to a certain form of OCD because people are becoming very obsessive about pieces of information that are not meaningful to their health status. So there's another psychological aspect to that. But to the extent that these wearable devices spool information up about the health of a population, it's very meaningful, lots of experimentation, but haven't really penetrated into the delivery of healthcare in exchange, uh, meaning it has an exchange into the provider delivery network. Primary care physicians aren't getting a download from all of their patients about their health status. But there's experimentation with it. You're going to see a lot more of it in the future. Great, thanks. Uh, so, Keith, a couple of questions on: uh, Could you talk about the correlation between oil prices and construction, and sort of the real estate industry? I deal with an eye towards Houston, and then what if you have any data or can speak to uh, Houston in particular? Your outlook for the coming year or two? Yeah. So, uh, the correlation between construction and oil prices in Texas. Uh, isn't as uh, close as you might expect. Uh, the 80s were an interesting time in Texas because we had oil prices changing about the same time as major real estate tax laws. Uh, 1980, they passed a tax law that said you can write off your real estate losses onto your other losses. So that created a big boom in real estate. And in 86, when oil prices fell, they took away that tax advantage. And that's why we had the 80s in Texas is that uh, part of the decline in the state was due to the oil price, but it also there was some independent shocks in real estate that caused the real estate industry to collapse, which brought down the banking, particularly the SNL industry. So it didn't happen this time, right? Because when we came into this oil price shock, real estate markets were very lean, and uh, we didn't have this kind of independent uh, real estate law shock. Uh, and so uh, what happened in Houston was, you know, people got afraid really quick because they know Houston is uh, a global center for oil and gas. And when oil prices collapsed, uh, I think in January of this year, about 13% of all uh, uh, office construction in the country was in Houston. So Houston was undergoing a major expansion in, in uh, uh, office markets, and people got, got really worried. They didn't stop projects that were already being built, but new projects got put on hold uh, really quickly. Now, real estate residential markets here in Houston were very tight, and they were behind the curve, so that helped a lot, too. And re a lot of the residential markets were behind the curve uh, uh, because of we just went through this... Uh, national uh, real estate collapse and Dodd-Frank came along and made it much more difficult for lending and he had some issues with lot development. So uh, obviously uh, they, the two industries are tied but uh, there's a lot of circumstances that affect those correlations. And so this year 
we've seen some slowing in construction employment growth, but uh, the real estate markets in most areas of the state remain healthy. Even, even in uh, Houston, the residential markets are still uh, in pretty good shape. The office markets are actually not in bad shape. We've seen some rise in vacancies as some of the major oil companies have kind of vacated space, uh, but it's nothing like the 80s. Uh, so the relationship isn't near as uh, kind of uh, a type, but uh, certainly there is that relationship, obviously, as uh, companies vacate space. But the markets aren't near as a bad shape as, say, the 80s, and that's one of the reasons why Texas uh, has not suffered as bad uh, due to this energy price shock. Thanks. What about, uh, do you have a sort of a quick view on Houston in particular for next year? So Houston, uh, right now, job growth is right around zero uh, for the year, and I expect there may be some slight job losses, uh, net job losses during the next four to five months. If oil prices, and I didn't really get into next year too much, but if oil prices remain about $45 a barrel, I expect job growth to pick up slightly next year in the state. And Houston's going to re probably remain uh, under 1%, but probably in the positive range. Uh, oil prices are tremendously difficult to predict. It seemed like it'd be easy. You know, you got world demand and world supply, but there's a lot of things out there that can change. Uh, and it's much easier to predict what it was, why it actually changed in the past and what it's going to do in the future. So right now, the, mo the mood amongst people is that oil prices, uh, uh, because of big inventories and such, are not going to go up very much. But that can change pretty quickly. But I don't see any big uh, downturn occurring uh, in the state or Houston. If you look at the state as a whole, it has to come from really Houston if it was going to be a big impact. because. Houston MSA is 25% of all jobs in the state. It's a big player. In Midland, Odessa is like 1.5% of all jobs. So Midland, Odessa, all the jobs in Midland, Odessa go away. That reduces our growth by 1.5%. So it's important, obviously important to West Texas, very important, uh, and the people there. Uh, but for the impact on the state, it, we have to look to Houston. And I think Houston uh, survives again next year. Uh, at a slow, very slow rate, but likely positive. Thank you. Okay, so la last question. Uh, so, so Earl, back to you. So you mentioned alternative fuels and, and mentioned Tesla. Uh, so a couple of questions. One is um, not so much Tesla's ele the electricity component, but just the distribution model. As a, as a traditional uh, car dealership uh, network, what's your view of how, how that model is working? And Unrelated, but also if you have time, mention um, anything that you see on the kind of LNG natural gas type front in terms of cars, please. Uh, yeah, first on the distribution model, um, you know, there's been a lot of publicity because Tesla has chosen not to, to franchise dealers. And most states have uh, franchise laws that protect um, uh, these dealers, like my company, Mr. Smith's here. Uh, and others. Um, these, these laws have their basis in the disproportionate power and leverage of the manufacturer against their distribution system, which has been abused over many years, and that's why these laws are in place. They're, they're not in place because of Tesla or anyone like that. But what happens is you have a family or a small business invest 10 or 15 million dollars in a building, and then the next year the, the manufacturer decides he's going to distribute directly and you know, make that 10 or 15 million dollar investment null and void. Well, you know that that had to be regulated over the years. That that's why these franchise laws. Uh, Tesla could easily address this by appointing one dealer for the state of Texas. Uh, it, it seems that they don't want to provide any margin because they're not a profitable business yet uh, to to have any local distribution. But it's it, it's more of a PR uh, issue than it is a material issue. Um, there is going to be a lot more push toward clean energy and higher fuel efficiency and lower emissions um, levels, uh, driven primarily by this Volkswagen debacle that I expect most of you have read about, this, this uh, deliberate cheating on diesel emissions. It will probably also likely um, reduce the popularity of diesel engines, which tends to be more of a European phenomenon than an American phenomenon. 
Although in luxury vehicles in the U.S., diesel uh, take rates have, have increased. So I think we're going to continue to see um, probably hybrids, you know, are, are a little more practical view than plug-in electric. Uh, Toyota sold millions of hybrids. Uh, we're, we're still going to see a push this direction. The natural gas thing doesn't seem to work that well. I, I, I don't know if, exactly why, because the price of natural gas uh, is very low, but it seems like the experts, the people who've invested the R&D money, uh, like Toyo, um, who spends a million dollars an hour in R&D, uh, they seem to be much more pushing toward fuel cells, and, and, and this is the long-term answer. These, these, these heavy batteries, you know, a Tesla car has a 1,200-pound battery in it. Uh, that's why it costs so much money. That's why the $30,000 electric cars aren't prevalent, don't sell, because it takes a big battery to get a couple hundred miles of range. So uh, a lot of experts don't think electric is long-term. Great. Thanks.